My guest today is Kenneth Bartlett, who is a professor of history in the Renaissance era at Toronto University. And this week, we are going to discuss a very particular city of the Renaissance history, and we're going to discuss the Florentines or history of Florence from Dante to Galileo. But first, I want to learn a little bit about you yourself and how what was it about the Renaissance era that got you so intrigued to study it. Well, when I began my PhD, I actually started working on English humanism and the influence of humanist texts on uh, English education at uh, Cambridge in the 16th century. But I won a fellowship, a Mellon fellowship to study in Italy. And as soon as I got off the plane in Rome, I realized that's really where I belonged. So I switched in order to study um, uh, really travelers and scholars in Italy during the Renaissance. And then that led to my general interest in, um, uh, in Renaissance history and Renaissance culture. So my specialty really is a very interdisciplinary approach to, uh, to humanism. Uh, and as much as I use art and architecture, literary texts, as well as the standard historical context, in order to study this period from several perspectives to create a kind of mosaic of the uh, of the Italian Renaissance. And I want to begin with Florence, which I thought was our main topic for today. And what was it about Florence that all these giants of Renaissance history that attracted all these people? And what was it that made it such a great Renaissance city? Well, in some ways, it, it was a curious place because unlike Venice, for example, or even uh, uh, even Genoa, it uh, is not a seaport. It wasn't enriched by the uh, by the Crusades. It wasn't Rome with the international connections of the church. It was inland on the River Arno, which is not really navigable in the summer. And it's in a river valley, unlike most of the cities in Tuscany, because it's not an Etruscan foundation. But what it did have, it had um, a tradition of producing extraordinarily high quality uh, woolen cloth. And it had to do not only with the quality of the sheep, but also with the um, uh, skills of the uh, of the artisans and the control of the cloth business by international merchants. And the result was the enormous profits that came from clothing um, uh, the nobility and wealthy merchants, mostly in northern Europe, but also elsewhere in Italy. And the profits that came from that and the mercantile connections that allowed for Florentines to establish uh, really what amounts to branches of their company in important cities like uh, uh, like Bruges or, uh, uh, or, or Paris or wherever. Um, and the enormous profits that um, initially came from the wool and cloth industry was then used in, uh, to, um, uh, to start banking. Because what do you do with surplus capital? And the surplus capital was used to um, lo make loans to other merchants or especially to kings and princes who were busy in the 14th century in particular and building states, dynastic territorial monarchies. And, and Florentine bankers helped them do that by, um, uh, by making funds available. So Florence became enormously wealthy and also it, succeeded in establishing what really is a guild republic. The Ordinances of Justice of 1293 uh, tossed out the old feudal uh, magnates and their urban associates and established in its place a republic uh, that would last from 1293 really until 1530 uh, with little bits and pieces in between um, in which the republic was compromised. But essentially lasted throughout the entire period of the Renaissance with a collective executive of, of nine men and the interests of the dominant mercantile class becoming, becoming central. So that's how it got its wealth and how it became interested in new forms of education and, and new models of culture um, really fell from that because these, mer these merchants uh, rejected the traditional feudal rural um, values of, uh, of the Middle Ages, and then were looking for new elements to validate their position in society, their social mobility, the acquisition of new wealth, the access to political power that wasn't inherited. And they saw a model in, in uh, the ancient world, 
when they looked at the ancient world, they saw a statesman like Cicero, someone very much like them, and, and involved in a republic, in fact, gave his life trying to save the republic. Um, a scholar educated at the school that Plato founded in Athens, the academy, neoplatonic writer and, and thinker, but a politician who moved socially from the equestrian to the senatorial class, married, had children, was deeply involved in almost every aspect of civil life. So the ancient world spoke much more effectively to the, these uh, elite privileged um, rulers of the city of Florence. And so they began to adopt as a kind of class ideology, these, uh, these values. And as they began to adopt them, they began to see that there was an opportunity to not only replicate um, classical models, but to adapt them to suit their own particular needs in the time in which they were alive. So that's the basic general background. Hmm. And I want to begin with one of the perhaps most famous Florentines who ever existed, perhaps. And of course, I don't want to discuss several famous people in our conversation, but one of them, of course, need no introduction, and that is Dante, who, of course, mm. wrote Dante's Inferno, Inferno, and he would have had a, had a tragic end, I think, with his exile, and because I really love Florence, and let's talk about how he came to become a, the famous writer that he is today. Well, Dante is 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 a a figure that I largely ascribe to the Middle Ages. In fact, uh, the first lecture in my Renaissance culture course, I explain why I don't begin with Dante, but I do begin with Petrarch. Um, Dante was very much part of that mercantile aristocratic elite that took power after 1293. He was a Guelph because the Guelphs had assumed power in the city and uh, had the support of the papacy, but in in the power struggles after 1293, he found himself on the losing side of the division within the Guelphs. He was a much more liberal Guelph who didn't want the papacy to essentially control the circumstances of Florence. So with, when the uh, so-called uh, Black Guelphs took power with the help of a, of a, of a papal uh, army, uh, Dante and Petrarch's father were exiled in 1301. Their property was confiscated and he spent the rest of his life as a wanderer. He never returned to Florence. He died in 1321 in Ravenna. And it was in this circumstance that he wrote the, um, uh, wrote the Commedia. He had already established himself to a degree as a thinker and a poet and, uh, and, and a scholar, but it was the experience of seeing Florence from without that allowed him to interpret not only his fellow citizens, but also the circumstances of his, uh, uh, of his life and the, the tragedy of his exile as a, a, a kind of metaphor for the human journey through, uh, through life. And, and that's why he begins on that Selva Oscura. And because the classical world had already begun to influence uh, men of his class, uh, he chose Virgil as his guide in hell and purgatory. But of course, as even as a justified pagan, Virgin, Virgil couldn't take him to heaven. So his uh, divine Beatrice, that uh, idealized, almost courtly love figure, um, um, uh, does that. But the reason I begin with Petrarch rather than with Dante is that Dante still largely thought like a medieval person. And the Virgil that leads him is not really the Virgil of the, of the Aeneid, it's the Virgil of uh, the Eclogue that seems to foretell the coming of Christ as uh, like an Old Testament prophet. He becomes a justified pagan, but one who has uh, foreknowledge of the Christian dispensation, but didn't benefit from it. So this really is the Virgil. And similarly, the... Uh, if you go through hell and purgatory, um, what you see is you see the seven deadly sins in operation. And they're the medieval structures in which um, uh, Dante's mind still operated, punishment and reward. So Dante really thought like a medieval person. Similarly, there was a their scholastic method in the way he formulates his, um, uh, his poetic journey. And ultimately in heaven, when he's led by Beatrice towards knowledge of God, it's really through saints like St. Bernard who, uh, who take him there. So I think Dante, despite the fact that he was very transitional and he 
illustrated examples of what would come after, was still mostly a medieval thinker. It was his uh, younger contemporary, um, Francesco Petrarca, Petrarch, who was born in 1304, that really um, begins um, the intellectual and cultural uh, revolution that we associate with the Renaissance. Hmm. And you mentioned that, that Dante was a Guelph, so let's go into what was a Guelph and a Ghibli, because they were kind of important to Florence as well. Well, yes. Um, I mean, if Gilbert and Solomon is right and every child born alive is either a little liberal or a little conservative, well, everyone born in Italy um, during the Middle Ages was either a Guelph or a Ghibli. And the struggle is, of course, largely political and worked out in terms of personalities and, uh, um, and the geopolitical circumstances of uh, individual papacies and individual imperial rules. But the problem really comes down to the question of sovereignty. With the collapse of the Roman Empire, who succeeded the empire in terms of the imperial sovereignty that Rome used to exercise? The emperors, especially after, Com after uh, uh, Charlemagne was crowned Holy Roman Emperor on Christmas Day of 800 in Rome, the Holy Roman Emperors uh, claimed that they were the successors of Roman rule in the West. However, a very crafty forgery that was believed until Lorenzo Valla proved it to be a forgery in the middle of the 15th century, the so-called Donation of Constantine, which was written in the latter part of the 8th century, uh, stated that Constantine, in recognition of the popes having cured him of leprosy, gave the rule of the West to the pope, to Pope Sylvester, when Constantine moved house and took the capital to Constantinople. This allowed the papacy then to claim uh, universal sovereignty. And they had a double claim because it was not only through the donation of Constantine, but also through the apostolic succession. St. Peter, according to this belief, um, uh, charged Peter with, uh, uh, with caring for his church, and Peter was the successor of, uh, was Christ's vicar on earth, and so consequently his successors as Bishop of Rome then wielded that ecclesiastical power. So popes claim to have both jurisdiction in the spiritual as well as in the temporal realm, something that they claimed right up until really the uh, second half of the 19th century. And there's still memories of it today when the Pope wears red shoes, the way Roman emperors used to wear red shoes. And uh, there are these memories that, uh, that exist. But in terms of how it worked out in Italy, it really depended very much on local circumstances. Um, you, uh, because Italy was an unstable place, continually warring. It was a mosaic of states. It was a... Uh, a small jurisdictions because Rome, the Roman unity of the peninsula had completely shattered uh, by the fifth century. And the rulers of these states um, were looking for justification for their rule. They were seeking sovereignty. And whether they went to the emperor and claimed that they were ruling in the name of the emperor, or whether they went to the Pope to claim that they were papal vicars depended on really local circumstances. So in a Ghibelline city like Milan, the um, house of, uh, of uh, Visconti was established because um, the emperor was able to do it. And the Visconti then claimed that they were ruling uh, in the name of the emperor. But in Guelph cities, um, because of the power of the bishop, because the Ghibellines were weaker, any number of reasons, the, uh, the Guelphs claimed that their sovereignty came from the Pope. But it was really an issue that came down to family, local, political concerns, that it came to, if your enemy were, um, um, were Ghibelline, like Siena was Ghibelline, um, you were Guelph, and Florence was Guelph, and vice versa. It provided protection because Ghibelline states could form alliances, Guelph states could form alliances. And in particular in Italy, the Guelph uh, position was strong because of the role of um, um, the cadet branch of the House of France, the House of Anjou, invited by the papacy to come into uh, Italy and clean things up. So the Guelphs, in fact, had a kind of standing army through the King of Naples, and the Ghibellines had to rely on either local forces 
or the occasional um, uh, incursion of Holy Roman emperors across the Alps. So it was really an issue of sovereignty and one that wasn't altogether solved uh, until um, really the middle of the 16th century when all of these things were vestigial and they were memories more than anything else. Although there were still, as I said, vestigial elements in the period of Italian unification, there was sort of Gimento when Pius IX claimed um, sovereignty as Christ vicar on earth and consequently the right to rule over the papal states and refuse to compromise uh, with the Italian unification. So it's a long and complicated story, but mostly it has to do mm. with why do I have the right to rule? Mm. And of course, another part of the Florence, Italy we have to talk about is the Popolo Minuto, of course, which was the mother merchant class. What was their role in Florence? With, and how did they become, become known as the Popolo Minuto? Well, Florence um, was, again, unusual because it had a very large, what we would now call industrial working class. The production of, 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 of cloth is labor intensive as well as capital intensive. And one of the things that uh, the mercantile elite did in order to ensure that they would control the city is um, in 12, I think it was 1289, they liberated all the serfs in the Florentine Cantado, the territory dependent on Florence. And that meant that there would be a, a, a constant supply of cheap labor. So these peasants from the countryside would continue to come into the city and they would work in the, in the cloth industry. They were um, paid a living wage when the industry was booming or when there was a shortage of labor. They were terribly oppressed and unemployed and often driven from the city when the cloth industry was languishing and there wasn't a, a, much of a market for Florentine cloth. They were oppressed in every way. Um, their salaries were mostly um, uh, uh, sufficient to maintain basic level of life when things were going well, but there was constant period, uh, there were constant periods of unemployment, and there were uh, moments when their oppression reached the stage where it was necessary to, uh, 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 to act. And the most dramatic of those was the Chompy Revolt of 13, um, 1378, when because of a war against the papacy, the War of the Eight Saints, beginning in 1375, because of the um, decline in the Florentine cloth industry as a consequence, because of um, some local issues, the Chompy revolted and they uh, claimed power. It wasn't, as Marxist historians often write, an, an early Marxist uh, um, a class revolution. It wasn't that at all. Because what the Chompy wanted is that they wanted in. They wanted to form a guild. They wanted part of the, the guild uh, government of the city. So they got one, the uh, Guild of the People of God, the Arte del Popolo di Dio, and a guild that was so large, it was three times the total political population of the city. And they consequently held office. They held office as priors. One of them, um, their leader, Michele di Lando, ended up as Gonfaloniere di Giustizia, the kind of chair of the collective, um, uh, the collective executive. And they began to agitate for better working conditions, higher salaries, and so on. This was something that couldn't be tolerated. So by 1381, the Chompy Guilds were, were suppressed and they were, and they were oppressed even more. Many of them were executed. Um, their um, overseers were no longer Italians. They were often Flemings because they didn't speak Italian and there was no way that there could be any kind of organization. The role of Michele di Lando terrified the political classes. So the popolo minuto, the poor, were, um, uh, were like almost everybody in pre-modern uh, times, um, uh, living a life that was nasty, brutish and short. So the situation of the poor in Florence was not particularly good. They relied on charity uh, when necessary, um, but they could uh, reproduce their numbers and even expand when their fertility rates rose and there was more uh, uh, immigration into the city and they had better salaries and um, uh, some measure of, of security. But these periods were always interspersed with terror with 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 terrible periods of great uh, suffering 
And of course, we have room. The next person I want to talk about, I don't have too much time, so I have to move on as quick. Well, not, uh, but um, it's a rather peculiar artist, I find, because Giotto, of course, is mostly known mm-hmm. for his famous perfect circle. And I want to, mm-hmm. and his background as well is rather fascinating to me because that as well is kind of sounds like a bit of probably duplicate strike of good luck, if you ask me. Mm-hmm. Um, so much of what we know, of course, comes from Vasari's Lives of Lives of the Artist, the first edition of which was 1550. So. 200 years after uh, mm. after after Giotto. And what Vasari was doing is creating almost a hagiography because the model for the lives of the artists are actually collections of saints' lives. So you had to find what uh, Vasari called i primi lumi, the first lights of this new style. And um, Vasari identifies Cimabue and identifies Giotto as uh, these remarkable people who came out of uh, the magical world of Florence. And Vasari suggests there must be something in the water of the Arno, something of the quality of light that produces generation after generation. The reality is what we talked about before, that those merchants, having seized power in 1293, needed new models of, um, uh, of self-knowledge and self-awareness and, and a vocabulary of communication. They needed to uh, live in a real world, that is, reproducing what the eye sees. They lived in a secular world where secular education was extremely important and where these things continued. And the themes of a painter like Giotto are, of course, largely religious. But at the same time, there's a secular element in as much as um, uh, the, the characters had individual personalities. Uh, they have that tactile quality is what Bernard Berenson described it. You could walk around them, you can hug them. Uh, you, and there's also an emotional uh, relationship amongst the characters. So these were divine figures that had been beamed down um, from, uh, from heaven in order to illuminate God's plan for man. These were human beings and they were ambitious. They functioned as, uh, as human beings. So it's not an accident that you know, among Giotto's great works are the works that are um, uh, 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 patronized by merchants. So the in in um, uh, the Arena Chapel, for example, in Padova by um, um, uh, by the merchant Scoveni, and in Florence, the two great chapels of the 1320s in Santa Croce, the Bardi and Purunzi Chapel, were the chapels of uh, great bankers. So there was a sense then of of celebrating life on earth and life as it was. And Giotto fulfilled this perfectly. And his new style was revolutionary, but it provided a vocabulary for these new groups in society to uh, exercise their self-image and to um, communicate themselves and others visually as well as in writing. I want to talk about this perfect circle, and I want to bring up the story with the Pope as well, as I mentioned in the beginning of our conversation about Giotto, because the story has it that the Pope sent an envoy because he heard of Giotto's impressive paintings, and an envoy did oh, it's just a circle, it's not, it's mm-hmm. nothing, I, you and I can do that, but he takes it back to the Pope anyway, but the Pope says, and the Pope is impressed, and he says that you don't seem to understand art much at all to the envoy he sent, and he was so was really impressed by Giotto's perfect circle. Yeah, um, and Giotto was invited to Rome. He painted uh, the cathedral, parts of the cathedral of Rome, St. John Lateran, uh, under Boniface VIII. Um, he uh, traveled all through the, um, uh, the, the, the peninsula. Th- these stories, of course, are like, like saints' legends. They mm. justify... Um, genius. They are an opportunity to connect uh, powerful people like popes or rich merchants or um, the Franciscan order at, uh, at Assisi with, uh, with painting. So um, I always uh, tell my students to look at, these, uh, at, look at these stories the same way you look at saints' legends. Um, you know, St. Augustine was right. If they, these things build faith, uh, they become true. Um, and if you understand uh, Giotto's uh, message um, from the perspective of a pope or a merchant, then these legends have some measure of, uh, of truth or validity. 
Uh, but the reality is that Giotto was a painter like almost all others, but one with perhaps greater talent and a desire to, to reinterpret how the visual world operated. So the sage legends are wonderful, but are they true? You know, there's an Italian saying, se non è vero e ben trovato. Does it matter if it's true? If it makes a good story, mm. it, like um, a religious belief, provides truth. But I want to know how, do we know how it managed to do the perfect circle, that how the technology, I think or maybe not technology is the right word, but how he used, how he managed to create this perfect circle, which yeah, you can look it upon Judo, it really is a piece of brilliant work, and it's simple, but still it's so hard to do. You can try to draw a perfect circle yourself, see how easy it is, but let's talk, <laughs> do we know how he managed to do this? Well, um, are you talking about Leonardo now? Uh, Giotto and his perfect circle. Oh, well, yeah, the story is that he was able to draw it and, um, um, well, he perhaps could. But there were, all, there were all kinds of instruments for creating perfect circles. And there's a huge backstory here. It goes back to antiquity. What did Plato have above the gates of the academy? Let none ignorant of geometry enter here. The belief that the not only the five platonic solids but geometry in general constituted the vocabulary in the language of God. And the reason for that is that the square and the hypotenuse is always equal to the square on the other two sides, regardless who you are, where you are, your condition, because it's an absolute truth. And the parallel is, of course, with the absolute truth of divine revelation. So God becomes the great geometer. And that is something that was portrayed right up to um, uh, right, right up until the uh, uh, the nineteenth century. William Blake produces God as a great geometer, and it was a medieval trope as well. What we're seeing is um, the mixture of a whole bunch of intellectual and cultural elements, a baggage of Western civilization that's mixed around. You the baggage is there, but you mix the stuff in your cases from one place to another and you um, use what is necessary under the circumstances in order to um, uh, uh, to make your point. So the use of geometry and we you know again we could go into this we could talk about Brunelleschi's use of geometry um, in the Passi Chapel or in the um, old sacristy of San Lorenzo doing exactly the same thing creating um, an element of perfection that allows man not to become God, but to exercise the power that God has given man through his reason, through his ability to speak, and also through his understanding and his soul. So that's really where it comes from. It's not just somebody being able to draw a circle. It's somebody who uh, reinterprets an old idea that predates Christianity and applies it to another kind of saint's life. So Vasari is creating a saint's life and the ability to uh, mediate between God and man is one of the things that saints do. So Giotto becomes a kind of saint. So of course, the, the next thing I want to talk about is of course the famous Medicis. And I want, well, I'm brief in the background because we're going to focus on two Medicis there. They had several Medicis produced and they were okay. famous bankers of the Renaissance, but I want to before, after we give a little background on, on them, I want to focus on Cosimo Medici and Lorenzo mm -hmm. the Magnificent. But okay. and like I said, okay. first let's give a brief in the background of how the Medici okay. came to power. The thing, the thing about the Republic that was uh, created in 1293 is it was inherently in, unstable because it had a collective executive. You held office for only two months as a, as a prior, and then you couldn't hold office for the next three years. Um, there was a complex system of election of lots and votes and all sorts of things. And there were then the, the conflicts within the city, conflicts over business, family feuds, um, all kinds of things. The, um, uh, the Republic then wasn't a stable structure. And this worked itself out in a number of crises. The, um, the uh, uh, collapse of the economy with, uh, in the 1340s, the Black Death, the um, Chompy Revolt, all of these things really reflect how the instability of the Republic um, 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 uh, was manifested. So by the time we get to the uh, beginning of the 14th century, 
we see that the world that it was that came about after the Chompy revolt was one of aristocratic privilege and the manipulation of the Republic for the benefit of those uh, wealthiest merchants who formed an oligarchy, which got ever smaller. The problem with that is that it not disenfranchised, but it marginalized large numbers of people who did have political access, who were uh, eligible for office, but who were really kept out because of the manipulation of the system. And the oligarchs realized that they had a problem in their hands, and they realized that the leader of the opposition was the wealthiest man in Europe, the um, head of the Medici Bank, who was very sophisticated, very knowledgeable, very uh, 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 cultivated, but he had no interest in being part of the oligarchy. He actually saw himself as the leader of the Popolani, the popular party against the oligarchs. The oligarchs tried in 1433 to uh, neutralize him by trumping up charges of treason. They arrested him, they were gonna execute him, but the Pope and the um, Duke of Ferrara and all kinds of other people said, if you do that, you're going to be our enemies. So they exiled him in perpetuity and confiscated some of his property. But doing that precipitated the very revolt the oligarchs feared the most. So in 1434, Cosimo de' Medici was invited back to the city and he came back to Florence in which the oligarchs had been expelled, their palaces were burned, and there was a power vacuum. Cosimo could have done anything at that point. He could have declared himself the ruler of Florence but he was an ideological Republican. And he truly believed in the distribution of power broadly over people who own property, pay taxes, and employed others. So instead of changing the Republic, he in fact allowed it to operate from everybody's perspective without any change. He made one tiny constitutional alteration. He ensured that his supporters would would be uh, a majority in the accoppiatori. That is, that's the committee who determined who was going to be eligible for political office and how they were chosen. And by doing that, he could decide how much opposition he wanted, how many members of the opposition he would accept, or the degree to which he was going to impose his own will on the city. And this is the way he ruled from 1434 until his death in 1464. He manipulated things from behind the scenes. He used his own wealth to support the Republic in really dramatic ways. He not only patronized art, he helped out the, um, uh, uh, the state treasury when necessary. He uh, provided ex an example. He did all sorts of things that made him not only a superb ruler, but also highly respected. So when he died in 1464, he was given the same title that Cicero had been given of Pater Patriae, the father of his people, and buried in Santa Croce underneath Veracchio's um, tomb cover. Um, uh, and he was it, it, almost a place of pilgrimage. So the thing about the Medici is that they began by being a political machine, manipulating a republic that still operated in ways that to most citizens hadn't changed. His son, Piero, who uh, ruled from 1464 to 1469, was not as successful. Partly he was ill. He had the family disease of gout. He was always in pain. He was short-tempered. And he had been raised as a prince. There were many um, conspiracies against him as a consequence. And had he lived much longer, my thought would be that he, the Medici would have been thrown out. But he had the good sense to die young. He died in 1469. Mm -hmm. And he was succeeded by his 20-year-old son, Lorenzo the Magnificent, uh, a truly remarkable human being. Um, an excellent poet, a, someone with a common touch, as well as being fantastically elegant, um, extremely intelligent. And he followed his father's uh, model of manipulating the Republic and bringing in members of the proud uh, patrician families so that they, they didn't feel um, uh, isolated. Uh, he ruled in many ways brilliantly. It was a great moment for Florence. Florence was, uh, was wealthy. It uh, had a significant diplomatic interest because his uh, grandfather had arranged with the uh, new Duke of Milan, Francesco Sforza, a division of power in the Italian peninsula and the Peace of Lodi. After 1454, there were five major states. They had spheres of influence and those were recognized. 
After 1455, the Italian League put them all together to protect Italy from foreign invasions. So it was a time of incredible peace in Italy. It was a time of security and stability. And that allowed money to be spent on things like culture, art, patronage, and, um, uh, and some social experiments as well, which are quite remarkable. But in 1478, Lorenzo crossed Pope Sixtus IV and his uh, totally um, uh, obnoxious um, uh, uh, family. And the result was a conspiracy within the city led by the Pazzi family, an extremely old, very rich family that had um, um, feudal origins, but um, uh, had been rehabilitated into the city as bankers, the Pope and the Pope's nephew. There was an attempt to murder Lorenzo and his younger brother Giuliano in the cathedral uh, at Easter in 1478. Unfortunately, uh, Giuliano was murdered. Lorenzo escaped, only wounded. And there was then the war of the Pazzi conspiracy against, against the Pope and between 1478 and 1480. And only Lorenzo's personal intervention of going to Naples and dealing with uh, Ferrante of Naples, a king who was the papal uh, leader of the papal army uh, that made it, that brought an end to it together with some other events like the Turks taking Otranto and stuff that we haven't got time to talk about. But Lorenzo was different after 1480 and Florence became a different place. He became much more distant, um, a bit paranoid. Um, he had he traveled with armed guards. He established a new council, a council of 70 that gave Medici supporters an automatic control over the, um, uh, the, the deliberations of the, of, the, of the Republic. And he himself became more, uh, I think, inward. Not only his art patronage became small personal private objects that he would keep uh, now in the Gabinetto degli Argenti in, uh, in the Pitti, but also his growing interest that had begun actually under his grandfather of Neoplatonic ideas, ideas that had to do with the uh, search for perfection and the ideal, um, the reading of very difficult texts, conversations and difficult poetry and difficult art. Um, the world of Poliziano, the world of Botticelli, the world of early, early Michelangelo. Um, these, and of course, the philosophical works of Marsilio Ficino and Pico della Mirandola. This was a world that separated the Medici culturally from the vast majority of the Florentine population, not just the poor, but even the mercantile elite. They wanted to make profits. They were hard-headed. Um, the Italians say Fiorentini sono sempre in bottega, and indeed they are. They're always thinking of profit. They're not thinking about absolute perfection. So the Medici began in some ways a decline um, as a consequence of the Pazzi conspiracy and being separated from the major cultural movements uh, of uh, the vast majority of the population. This was capitalized by Girolamo Savonarola, who was a Dominican monk from Ferrara, who had been appointed the abbot of the monastery of San Marco. And he played upon the deep religious traditions and the mystical traditions of Florence, the, uh, the Fraticelli, the spiritual Franciscans, um, the, uh, um, uh, uh, the prophecies of Joachim of Fiore, the, um, uh, the love of Sant Antonino, the um, Archbishop of, of Florence and his support for the poor. And as a result, the Medici became more isolated and Savonarola got more and more popular influence. And when Lorenzo died very young in his early 40s in, um, uh, in 1490, uh, 1492, the, his, the Medici largely collapsed in part because his son, Piero, was every father's nightmare. He was a braggart, he was a brawler, he was stupid, he was paranoid. He, uh, he was everything his father was not. And he lasted barely two years before the French invasions and Savonarola's influence ensured the Medici were going to be expelled and um, a new form of government uh, uh, created. One until 1498 under Savonarola's influence, but still a republic and a very broadly based republic. And then after Savonarola's fall, a broadly based republic that produced Niccolò Machiavelli, um, who was its second chancellor. So uh, that's the Medici. Uh, 
there. And of course, the Medici has a whole lot bigger story than we just covered here, and I do plan to cover them eventually in the future. So hopefully one day I will cover them as well. But you landed nicely in there, so let's talk about Machiavelli, because he's probably one of the most famous Florentines mm-hmm. to ever exist, I think, if you... Of course, you know, Leonardo da Vinci as well, but mm-hmm. Machiavelli perhaps equally so. So let's talk a little bit about, about Machiavelli, because Machiavelli is a of because a famous term as well. Yes, Ma- Machiavelli is not only fantastically interesting, but he's actually an incredibly attractive character. Most people uh, think of Machiavelli only as the author of The Prince, but The Prince is a small work that was occasioned for a, at a particular moment in 1513. Machiavelli, who had been second chancellor of the Republic, responsible for a lot of diplomatic work, was a a genius in almost every way. He wrote brilliant diplomatic uh, responses. He was a great diplomat himself. Uh, He wrote plays. The Mandragola is still performed, still funny. His letters are wonderful reading. Uh, He wrote very thoughtful books like the Discourses on on Livy, which is really Discourses on Florence, using Livy as a kind of uh, excuse. But the prince is remembered because it seemed to um, talk about a new kind of statecraft in which amorality and whatever worked uh, would be um, uh, uh, would be acceptable. And we have to put it in context. Machiavelli was a Republican in every way. He was high-minded. He was um, a, a Republican in office and in theory, and the discourses make this absolutely uh, clear. He was a Florentine um, patriot, um, as the first and second decades indicate real, so clearly. But he also was a patriot who realized that Florence was endangered, an, an existential danger. And he needed, consequently, to provide an alternative. He provided a solution, and the solution was harsh the coming of a man on horseback who would then solve all the problems of, uh, of Florence and then go away. This is a Florentine tradition. Um, they had done it in 1313. They had done it in 1327. They had done it in, in, um, um, in so many uh, uh, instances. But what he was suggesting is that for, for Italy to be free, because he talks about Italia, in fact, he uses Petrarch's Italia Mia, as chapter 26 of the Prince. He says that we have got to out, we have to be more barbarous than the barbarians. We have got to forget our principles and our values in order to save ourselves. And then we can go back. He thinks of Cincinnatus, the uh, Roman dictator who saved uh, the Republic, but then gave up power willingly and went back to his plow and started right back in the same furrow that he had started before being called. Um, so the prince is, is an occasion piece. It's to save Italy from the barbarians in 1513. It was dedicated to the Medici governors of the, uh, of, of the city, uh, ruling in the name of the Pope. Okay. So you can't think of Machiavelli as the author of The Prince only. You have to, as I tell my students, if you read The Prince, you've got to read it in the context of the discourses on Livy. He was writing the two simultaneously. And it really explains so much of what the prince is uh, is all about. But Machiavelli is an extremely attractive character. He never got his jog back. <laughs> he was given uh, the charge to write a history of Florence by uh, the future Pope Clement VII. And the history of Florence is one of the great works of historiography. Um, he was a remarkable human being and one that you would really like to have dinner with, one that you'd like to spend time with. Mm. So, unfortunately, we don't have time to do for Jimmy. We don't have time to go into Leonardo da Vinci as much as we would love to. But I want to end the last person, of course, is one. You know, this is just a few famous people, and I think most people will need to be familiar with our last person on the list, which is Galileo Galilei. <laughs> okay, let me just say a few words about Leonardo because there's actually yeah. a kind of connection. Leonardo wasn't born in Florence, he was born in Vinci. and. Um, he uh, was trained in Florence in the workshop of Adocchio, um, but he didn't really get on very well in Florence. Um, he didn't like the continual need to, to compete with other workshops. Uh, he worked too slowly. He uh, um, didn't like changing. And the Medici hated him because he was charged twice with sodomy, never convicted. But the reason, one of the reasons he wasn't convicted is that 
he uh, was um, indicted with um, a member of the Tornaboni family, and that was Lorenzo's mother's family. Lucrezia Tornaboni was Lorenzo's mother. And so um, Leonardo, uh, Leonardo was associated with, um, and he was very openly living as a gay man in, um, uh, in Florence and uh, was an extremely attractive figure in many ways, always dressing in pink, superb dancer, great swordsman, brilliant musician who um, could do almost anything. So he wasn't really a success in Florence. Galileo is, an, is a different situation. First of all, the world had changed. Um, he grew up in the period of the Medici monarchy. The Medici monarchy was um, uh, the um, Medici monarchy was established after 1530 and became a hereditary monarchy after 1537 under Cosimo I. And the intellectual world became smaller. And the role of the church, especially at the end of the 16th century, after the Council of Trent, after the need to control ideas, um, uh, operated in Florence the way it operated almost everywhere else. Leonardo, um, uh, Leonardo uh, Galileo, remember, was taught not in Florence, but he taught in, uh, in Pisa, where he was a uh, professor of mathematics and other things, you know, dropping lead balls from the uh, Torre Pendente. Uh, then he went to Padova. He taught in Padova for a number of years. He actually didn't spend that much time in Florence. He came from a patrician family. His father was a member of a camerata, the musical group uh, that actually gave Leonardo one of his experiments about how to measure time by the, by the uh, vibration on strings. But he spent most of his time away. And when he did return to, uh, 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 to Florence, he was attacked by the conservative clergy, especially the Dominicans of Santa Croce, because what he said was contrary to, um, uh, in some ways, 17th century common sense after 1616. And that is, you know, the, the world isn't the way it appears to be. It's actually far more complex. And it agreed with Copernicus's 1543 uh, De Revolutionibus, which said that the sun was the center of the universe and not the earth. Galileo proved that this indeed was the case. He went further. He used his telescope, something he largely invented, they perfected, to show that the moon wasn't- well, Wasn't the, the telescope really a German invention as far as I Well, know? yeah, it was invented in a Dutch invention. Yeah, it was uh, invented, uh, um, well, the ancients had telescopes. The ancients had um, uh, used the uh, ground lens and Robert Grosteste and the Bishop of Lincoln in the 13th century had a telescope. But it's one thing to have one that's used as a toy or used to sit sails of ships on fire like the ex Greeks of Syracuse did. It's something else to change the way we see ourselves in the universe, which is what Galileo did. He looked through his telescope and what he saw um, was that the moon wasn't perfect. The moon was cratered and, and, and ugly. This was a challenge as well because the book of Genesis said only the earth fell because of the sin of Adam and Eve. The rest of the universe should have been perfect because God creates only perfect things. And he said, no, that's not the case at all. He was hauled up before the Inquisition for teaching Copernicanism, for um, arguing all sorts of things the church did not accept, and for writing a very famous letter to the wife of the Grand Duke of Tuscany, the Medici Grand Duke, um, Grand Duchess Christina. And in that letter, he said, if you want to know about science and about the rational world and the universe, don't go to scripture. Go to experimentation, go to what you can see, go to what you can prove, that there's no point in arguing that uh, the earth must be the center of the universe because Joshua, God allowed Joshua to make the sun stand still. So that's not an argument. So Galileo said, we must first trust our own senses, our experiments and mathematical proof. And that got him into a great deal of trouble. He was charged by the inquisition to stop teaching Copernicanism. He did for a while, but then he wrote his great book, Dialogue in the I bet he did World. not expect the Inquisition, did he? No, he, uh, he didn't. No, uh, the, uh, 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 the Spanish, you never expect the Spanish Inquisition, as we know from Monty Python. Um, mm -hmm. But he, um, the thing about it is, is that, again, it's very complicated. And you have to know how the Inquisition worked in order to understand this. Galileo and if I may add that, if I may add to this, we did actually make an episode early on in the podcast about the Spanish Inquisition 
yeah. where we discussed so how the Spanish Inquisition works. So if you want to take a look at closer, I highly recommend mm-hmm. checking out their episode about should you expect the Spanish right, Inquisition. Right, right. And the Spanish Inquisition was different from the Roman Inquisition, which was established uh, by Paul III in, 14, in 1543, um, together with the Index of Prohibited Books at around the same time and all of those other things. But what Gal- the Inquisition simply adjourned Galileo's trial. He still was under orders not to teach uh, Copernicanism. But he wrote his great book, The Dialogue of the Two Great World Systems, that is Copernicanism, that is the geocentric and, and uh, heliocentric uh, universe. And it got an accidental imprimatur from the Inquisition. Galileo was a friend of the Pope, and Galileo thought he was safe because he didn't come down on one side or the other. He simply put the argument out there in an open dialogue. But the Inquisition, led by Roberto Bellarmine and others, um, said, nope, he's still a heretic. He's still practicing heresy. He was brought before the Inquisition and given a choice. He could either... um, be executed and burned as a consummation heretic, or he could adjure. He was old, he was almost blind, and he chose the latter with those famous words, e pure se muove, and yet it, the earth, moves. He was sentenced to house arrest for the rest of his life in, in his villa d'Archetri, uh, a villa that you walk by today, walking up to the top of the hill. So Galileo is an unusual thing. He came from Florentine rationalism. But he spent not very much time in Florence, except at the end of his life when he was imprisoned there. Um, So we really must see him as an Italian and suffering from uh, the the Italian Roman Inquisition, as opposed to anything that was particularly Florentine. And I want to end there with what what would you say is the legacy of all those people and the the Renaissance Florence that we still as with us today, what did it say? Legacy of Renaissance Florence. Is? What did it? Sorry, legacy. The legacy of the Renaissance. Well, the, the legacy. The legacy of the, of the Renaissance is to um, create a world that's based on human values, to accept the concepts of human agency, human autonomy, that we make ourselves the invention of the autonomous individual. Uh, which was really beginning with Petrarch, that we make ourselves the people that we are. We're not actors in a play written by God. We are not simply here to illustrate the divine plan for man. We can make the world better, make ourselves better, make the community better through the application of our reason and our words, in particular our, our speech. We can externalize our experience by inventing linear perspectives and correct anatomy so that we can reproduce what the eye sees. We can, in other words, create an imaginary world to function as a metaphor for the real world, but it's up to every individual to interpret that according to his or her own experience and his or her own needs. And that, I think, is the great contribution of the Renaissance. And I think that's a wonderful message. I'm going to end it there. Thank you so much for coming on. Before you go, do you have any social media or anything, any place where people can buy your books? Which I would highly recommend to do, and I will um, do this one set. So the books are, yep, yeah, the books are all available on uh, on uh, on Amazon, and um, either um, the Re- uh, 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 the Renaissance in Italy, a history, um, is a good place to start. A short history of the Italian Renaissance, which I wrote in the University of Toronto uh, 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 Press. Um, the Age of the Medici in Savonarola by Hackett. These are all available, and you can follow up what I've been saying and in much more detail by um, uh, by reading the books. Thank you so much for coming on. We even had a little minor musical number today, which is a first for the podcast. This has been with that age to well. You can find us on Twitter or X, whatever it is called these days. On and with that age to well, we are available on Instagram. And with that age to well, you can find us on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, YouTube wherever you can find podcasts these days. If you are on Apple Ives or iTunes, please consider writing a review and I would try to read it out on the podcast. That would certainly help us out a lot. If you are on Spotify, give us five stars. That would be nice. And on YouTube, please like, share and subscribe. My name is Alan and I will see you next time.